Welcome, everybody. I want to personally welcome you to the MedRhythms video cast series. This is a monthly series where we'll be talking to world experts in the field of neurology, research, rehabilitation, and music, and discussing all things from digital therapeutics to music and neuroscience, rehabilitation, and neurology. Each month, we feature a new expert who will provide valuable insight into these important topics. This month is hosted by me, uh, Brian Harris, the co-founder and CEO of MedRhythms a digital therapeutics company focusing at the intersection of neuroscience, technology, and music to build interventions that transform lives of those living with neurologic injury or disease. If you'd like to learn more about MedRhythms, please visit our website at www.medrhythms.com. I hope that you'll find today's episode interesting, meaningful, and compelling, and I believe that you will. And today, I'd like to introduce our esteemed guest, Dr. Magdi Salim. Dr. Salim is a professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School and is the chief of the Division of Stroke and Cerebrovascular Disease at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. He maintains extensive academic, educational, clinical, and research activities across a broad range of stroke-related topics. He is the director of the BIDMC Comprehensive Stroke Center and is a fellow of the American Heart Association, American Stroke Association Stroke Council, the European Stroke Organization, and the American Neurological Association. Dr. Salim is known for his interest and in research in intracerebral hemorrhage. He has been a longstanding member of the writing groups of the AHA guidelines on the management of ICH and is a member of the AHA Hemorrhagic Stroke Advisory Board. Dr. Salim is also a member of the MedRhythm Stroke Scientific Advisory Board. Welcome, Magdi. It's an honor to have you here with us today. Well, thank you, Brian, and thank you for the kind introduction. It's my pleasure. Well, to get us started, um, I was hoping that you could maybe explain a little bit more about your role as a neurologist and the chief of stroke at Beth Israel. Uh, sure. Uh, I think there are different roles. So as a chief, uh, I have a lot of administrative responsibilities. Uh, so I, I oversee uh, the comprehensive stroke center at Beth Israel, which includes a lot of integration between stroke neurology, neurosurgery, the emergency department, uh, but maybe it's better to focus on my clinical role as a, a neurologist. So I'm a stroke neurologist, as you mentioned, and basically I take care of patients that come in with a stroke or any condition that's affecting blood vessels, either in the brain or blood vessels that are going to the brain. So I deal with these patients from the minute they come to the emergency room, we help with the diagnosis, treatment, when they're admitted, uh, I see them in follow up and I see them as they grow through the different stages of their disease and recovery and rehabilitation. Great, thank you. And just for the, the, the viewers that may be unaware, can you talk a little bit about what a stroke is and what the different types of strokes are and you know, sort of the prevalence that uh, exists with strokes? Sure. Uh, so, I mean, generally speaking, I think stroke is sudden interruption in blood flow to the brain. So it, usually it's to a certain part of the brain and depending on which part of the brain is affected, uh, you can get different symptoms. So it can be problem with speech, it can be weakness of an arm or leg, uh, it could be incoordination, losing vision. Uh, so the, the interruption of the blood flow, there are two different ways this can happen. Uh, one of them is a blockage. So there is not enough blood going to the brain and the blockage could be because there is a blood clot and that's usually something that comes from the heart or maybe a buildup of cholesterol inside the wall of the blood vessel that blocks it. And, and this, when this happens, this is called ischemic stroke. Uh, and, and this is much more common. It's maybe 85% of strokes are ischemic strokes. And then the, there's the other kind where the interruption of the blood flow because the blood vessel rupture. Uh, and as a result, you get bleeding in the brain. Uh, so that tends to be a little bit less common uh, in the United States and maybe in Western countries, around 15% of strokes. Uh, but in Asia, that says, this tends to be a little bit higher than this maybe in the 20s. Excellent. And, and as we look at uh, maybe throughout the world or the US, what is the prevalence of strokes? Uh, you know, how many people have strokes in a year that, or even that maybe perhaps come through your hospital? Uh, well, come through our hospital, uh, I, I can tell you between the two, we're talking about close to 700 patients a year that mm. come in with either ischemic stroke or hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, 
uh, if you talk about just uh, hemorrhagic stroke in, 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 the, in the United States, probably 75,000 a year. And if you talk about stroke and ischemic stroke, then you're talking about maybe close to 450,000 or 550,000 in this range. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. I mean, it, once somebody has a stroke and they come into the hospital, what does that journey sort of, of stroke care across the continuum look like? Well, un unfortunately, it's a long journey. So uh, I, I think you start really in the emergency room. Uh, so, it, and then you get admitted. Uh, so, so the initial journey is that we're trying to figure out what's wrong. And then the patient gets admitted. We're trying to find out what caused the stroke. We're trying to treat them to minimize the damage that happened from the stroke. We're trying to prevent medical complications after a stroke. So there is a lot of testing going on. You start the process of rehab. Uh, and then from, so there's physical therapy, occupational therapy, uh, swallowing difficulties are very common. That's after a stroke too. And then after this, patients usually go to a facility where they receive rehab. Uh, again, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, depending on their notes. Uh, uh, and then after this, we see them in clinic to help them as they go through the recovery process uh, and to try to do our best to prevent another stroke from happening. And when you talk about your comprehensive stroke clinic there, what, what sort of services does that look like? When we talk about comprehensive, what does that really mean? So comprehensive really integrates all of these things. So mm -hmm. it integrates that you diagnose them very early, whether they have a stroke or not, uh, because time is very sensitive in diagnosing stroke and treating it. Uh, you try to find out the reason why they had the stroke. Uh, I mean, I made it simple when I said ischemic and hemorrhagic, but within each one of these, there are different reasons and different causes why people have stroke. Uh, so there is diagnosis, there is treatment, uh, there is then all these support services that I mentioned, uh, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech and language pathology. Uh, they, these are all integrated to help with the recovery. Uh, and then a lot of stroke patients, because of the deficits that they have after they leave the hospital, there are a lot of, uh, when they go out just home or in the society, they have a lot of needs, whether there are social needs or there's social worker that uh, is involved. Uh, again, the rehabilitation or physical therapy may take longer in some patients than others, so that might be an ongoing process for a while after they leave. Uh, learning how to drive again or assessing how safe they can drive. So these are all different services that you actually need to integrate together to treat a stroke patient. Great. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about those ongoing services um, in a little bit, but you know, I think uh, sort of germane to the times here as we are, it's April, 2021, um, hopefully on the tail end of the global pandemic that we've been living in for the last uh, uh, you know, 12 to 14 months. Um, and I know that you um, co-authored a paper recently about a decrease in hospitalizations um, for those who've had stroke due to COVID-19. How is COVID-19, for those folks that may not understand, why would that be? How has the pandemic impacted stroke and stroke care? Wow. Okay, that's a <laughs> that's a long question. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think it imp impacted it in different ways. Actually, it impacted it in the at the pre-hospital level, the hospital level, and after discharge. Mm -hmm. and, and the impact has come in in different ways, and even the timing also has been different. So, uh, in the first peak when it started last March, April, there was really significant drop in patients coming to the hospital. And not just stroke people, also with heart attacks. And there were many reasons for this. One of them is that people were really afraid to come to the hospital at this time and leave the house. So people that have some subtle deficits waited and then it went away and maybe even they didn't know that they had stroke. There was a big problem with older people and social isolation. And if they lived alone, that their children could not see them and unfortunately, they would have a massive stroke and they fall at home and no one would know. And by the time you actually hear about it, unfortunately, it's sort of too late. So there was actually at the same time, there was a rise in the number of people that were found dead in their homes, uh, which 
maybe due a stroke or due a heart attack, we don't know. Uh, so, so that was a big drop back then. Uh, but fortunately, in the second wave and after this, this didn't happen because there was a huge public campaign to educate people that still go to the hospital is probably the safest place for you and don't stay home when you, when you have something like this. But in terms for us physician, physicians and caring for these patients and the treatment of these patients, it, it was affected at a significant level because, uh, so number one, the patient would come to the ED and we need to do a lot of things in a very timely fashion to diagnose the stroke very quickly. When COVID with its peak and up until now, you assume that everyone that comes in has COVID unless you do a test and you know that they're negative. And unfortunately, the results of these tests are not quick enough. So there is always a delay, especially at the beginning, was everyone was scared in getting any test until you know that the patient is negative first. And maybe you don't know this, but last March and April, it would take us actually you needed two negative tests, and each test might take two days back then. Now, of course, it's only hours, but back then we're at the beginning and we were learning a lot of things. So you can set for two or three days, you really the patient is just sitting, waiting to be negative before we can do anything with them. Same thing for like physical therapy, occupational therapy, people assessing them. No one wants to go and talk to the patient until they're sure that they're COVID negative because we were minimizing interaction with these patients. So of course, delayed everything. Uh, and even trying to get the patient out of the hospital to the right facility where they need rehab. That was a big challenge because at that time, as you know, there was a problem with COVID in nursing facilities. And the, these places were refusing to take patients again until you know that they are COVID negative. So there was a huge backlog and, and patients were just staying in the hospital for a very long time. Uh, I'm glad to be honest with you, this, this is over because it, it was a tough time for us as physicians and for patients as well. Yeah, it sounds it. It sounds it. And, and are we seeing that things are changing now or are things looking back better than they were? No, yeah, definitely better. I mean, I, I think we, we have learned a lot over the last year. Uh, as I said, our testing is better. Uh, now, almost all the medical community is immunized. The sphere does not exist as before. Uh, the rehab facilities are more familiar with it. I, I think the process is, is much better than before, definitely. It's not back to normal 100%, but I would say at least 85% to 90% were back to where we were before. That's great, great to hear. And you, know, you, you talked a lot about sort of that acute phase of stroke, but as you mentioned before, as people even leave rehabilitation hospitals, there's ongoing deficits, ongoing needs, community-based programs, these things that folks need to be a part of to help to continue to recover. How did COVID impact sort of that long-term uh, sort of uh, rehab or recovery? Okay. So, you know, everything became remote mm -hmm. <laughs> since COVID started. So most of our assessments that people are afraid to come to the hospital, you do this by video, by Zoom, like we're doing now. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of the physical therapy and rehabilitation is also was done remotely, just showing people and families what to do. So mm -hmm. obviously not the same when you have an experienced person there actually assessing the individual and tailoring everything exactly to, to what they need. Uh, so I, I think it definitely affected uh, the quality of what we do to some extent. Yes, certainly. Certainly. And as a, as a neurologist, were you required to uh, engage in telemedicine or use technology in any sort of way? Or uh, given your role, were you, uh, you know, sort of yeah. like a as a stroke neurologist, we have the advantages that uh, telemedicine is not new for us. So mm. we actually, this is like the bread and butter of a stroke neurologist. We always do it for the outlying hospitals because they don't usually have a stroke experts. Mm -hmm. So we evaluate the patients remotely and we decide what needs to be done. And then we bring some patients to us to provide some therapy that may not be available in a community hospital. Uh, but clearly for neurology in general, and even for us, not just in the acute phase now, in follow-up in the outpatient clinic, uh, I mean, I, I would say it's just the use of uh, telemedicine and video evaluation really 
blossomed. Uh, and I think it's probably here to stay. So it's, uh, there is some good things about it. There are some patients that's actually difficult for them to come to the hospital. Some patients that because of the commute, because of the parking, because of uh, many issues, they, they would not keep their appointments. Now they're at home. It's actually easier to reach them and to provide some care that maybe they did not have before. So there, it's a mixed blessing, I think. <laughs> There's both of them. <laughs> I would agree. I think that it has forced us to be more flexible as uh, clinicians, as healthcare providers, and by virtue of that, has expanded access to some services, as you mentioned, that uh, you know folks may not have access to otherwise. Definitely. Um, so let's talk a little bit about more about your uh, research interests um, and maybe some of the new research that you have going on um, uh, as of lately. Well, so I, I'm interested really in anything that uh, improves the outcome of stroke patients. <laughs> so no matter what it is, uh, but, but my main interest, and I, I guess maybe what I just became successful in, uh, has been in this kind of stroke, which is not caused by a blood clot, but a bleeding in the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I do actually, I'm interested in a lot of different things when it comes to bleeding in the brain. So I'm interested in... Uh, how we can manage the, the, the toxicity or the injury that happened from iron. So after a bleeding in the brain, mm -hmm. uh, the blood cells break down and they have iron in the hemoglobin, it leaks out. And we have learned that this is actually not helpful for the brain, it actually mm -hmm. injures some parts of the brain and can impede recovery. So uh, I, this is one of the main areas of research, research that I'm, I'm interested in and how to handle the toxicity of iron to improve outcome. Uh, I'm interested in uh, surgical evacuation of the bleeding in the brain uh, and how to, there are now different devices that you can use to actually aspirate blood out of the brain. Uh, but I'm interested, my, my interest goes a little bit behind, it's just removing the blood, but actually using this as a way to deliver therapies into the brain to promote recovery, to help with the recovery. Uh, I'm interested in the effect of uh, statin drugs, which are cholesterol lowering medications uh, on patients with uh, brain bleed. Uh, there is some debate out there whether they're helpful or harmful. So I, uh, I have research going on for that as well. Uh, and in terms of the different kind of stroke, I'm actually interested, there's an overlap. I'm interested in the effect of sleep mm. and sleep deprivation. On, on the recovery and outcome of stroke patients, whether it's ischemic or hemorrhagic. So these are the areas that... Uh, uh, Very interesting. Are, is there anything you can share about what you've learned in, about the impact of stroke or, or I mean, about the impact of sleep um, for, for stroke care? Uh, well, I mean, I, I think we know there is a lot of data that uh, some of the things we do in the hospital when people come in and because we care about them so much, we. We do this neuro checks every one hour, every 30 minutes, every 15 minutes. There is no question that people in the hospital are sleep deprived. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is a question, at least we know from animal models that this actually sometimes is not very helpful. Uh, so I don't have clear solid data to share with you, but, but there are some studies to suggest that uh, not sleeping well can actually impede the recovery after a stroke. So whether it's in the acute phase, whether later on, I, I think it's, it's, it's an area now that's, that there is a lot of interest in it. Very, very interesting. Um, and it would be interesting to see how that, uh, I mean, because that could really change the demographic or not demographic, but really change how stroke care is delivered. Um, you know, those types of things, as you mentioned, because it's such a prevalent issue in the hospital stays. And I mean, there is also another component to it is that uh, there are a lot of things that have what we call circadian pattern that they change throughout the day. So there are some effects of medications that they might be more effective during the day than at night. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are things that happen within our body that might be different at eight o'clock in the morning than eight o'clock at night. Uh, so there is a lot to learn there. And I think the future will see a lot of changes. Uh, people will start to pay close attention to this. Very interesting, very interesting. And then as we think about, obviously at, at MedRhythms, we're building uh, interventions for folks along the stroke care focused uh, you know, early on on chronic stroke care, but uh, for folks who have ambulation deficits. And we know that uh, 
you know, uh, gait problems or walking issues are, is a prevalent problem um, in stroke survivors. You know, what are, do you hear from patients or, you know, what impact does walking deficits have on stroke survivors, both within the hospital and sort of, uh, I guess, long-term as well? Well, I mean, I, I, I guess the simple answer is that walking deficit has a huge impact on anyone whether it's a stroke survivor or really a normal person that just breaks the, the leg, <laughs> right? right. A, a, a young person. I mean, ambulation is really key to being independent, to do what you want to do every day and just to go on with your everyday activity. So just having a problem with not being able to walk is a significant problem uh, for patients, for families, for people even quality of life and really being able to slowly go back to their kind of normal activity. And unfortunately, it's very common, as you mentioned, in stroke patients really early on, maybe 60% of the patients have problems with ambulation. Uh, and there are different reasons for this. Maybe it's weakness, maybe it's uh, stiffness and spasticity of the muscles. Uh, after a stroke, maybe it's uncoordination. And uh, so there are different reasons why people struggle with this after a stroke. Uh, and, and yeah, it's clearly one of the major complaints and one of the probably the most really disabling deficits. Mm. Uh, if you have only one arm that's affected, I mean, of course, it's a problem, but you still can do a lot by just being able to walk and do everyday thing. But if you can't walk, you're really right. chair down to some extent. Yes. Right. No, it's interesting. Because, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and then it adds another problem because if you're not walking very well, and of course everyone is eager to walk, it's, it's one of the common reasons really for fall too after a stroke. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's another significant problem that we deal with. That, that, so you had a stroke, you fall, you break a bone, then you get into another complicating problem, obviously have a huge impact on right. long-term recovery. And, it can often be the sort of the first snowflake in the snowball um, of that happens, uh, um, you know, long term post these injuries. Yeah, exactly. Well said. And it's interesting because you know, as as we talk to stroke survivors, and you know, as a clinician talking with stroke survivors, you would think the answer to that question, what kind of impact does walking deficits have on life, is a pretty obvious question, right? It's obviously if you can't walk, it's a, it's a problem. But what you start to really realize when you, and I'm sure as you mentioned that it's one of the most reported problems that stroke survivors have, about how it really is correlated to those things like independence. You know, if you need somebody to help you walk um, and you're living at home and your significant other works or you don't have somebody there, you could be confined to your home for a period of time. You can't get out and about in the, in the community, which um, also all has deleterious effects on health long-term as well. And unfortunately, it's one of those things that you really tend to underappreciate until it happens to you. Right. So I, I, I broke my ankle a few years ago mm. and it was really a wake up call for me because exactly as you said, I, I was home for three months and you really are completely dependent on, mm -hmm. on other people to help you. And it's, it's quite disabling. So it's, yes, it's yes. Well, well, thanks for that. And, you know, also speaking, it'd be interesting to get your perspective as we think about walking interventions. And, you know, we're focused a lot on rhythmic auditory stimulation. So the use of rhythm and music to improve walking. I mean, what has your, your experience been around the, the literature here or the, you know, the potential impacts of the intervention to improve walking or to not improve walking um, with people post-stroke? Well, I mean, it's, it's obviously one of the interesting techniques or ways out there to improve walking. I mean, it, it has a long history in people with Parkinson's disease mm -hmm. uh, and, and maybe in people with MS to some extent. And in, especially in people with Parkinson's, it has been shown to actually improve the speed with which you walk, uh, the, the stride, uh, a little bit of the stability. And even when people looked at the muscle function and they did uh, electric testing to assess for the muscle strength, like using something like EMGs. Uh, they actually it showed that there's improvement in muscle strength with that. So it's, it's obviously a promising technique. There is no question about that and a promising strategy. Uh, it's, uh, there is some literature about it in stroke, mm -hmm. uh, not as much as in, in other areas, uh, but I don't see why it would be different. Uh, to be honest with you, because again, there are many different reasons why people can walk. 
and, and there is a common link with all neurological conditions for the reasons why people they can't walk. So I, I, I think it's very promising. I'm, I'm personally, I mean, th that's why I think how we met each other. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. How I heard about this. Right. And, you know, from your perspective as a, and I, and I always like asking the physicians that we talk to on these, just to get perspective about, you know, new interventions, as you mentioned, you know, there's good research in PD, there's less research in stroke, but there's some early research to show that it's promising here. You know, what level of evidence, um, what type of evidence is necessary for you as a neurologist treating patients to say, hey, this is worth a try with your patients? Or, you know, how do you evaluate those decisions? So it, it really depends on what the intervention is and, and on what, what the purpose is. So the gold standard, of course, in, in medicine, everything we want a randomized controlled trial to show mm -hmm. that the intervention is effective and, and making a difference. Uh, but, but again, it really depends on, and maybe my view here is a little bit different than others, but uh, so the goal if you want to improve someone's walking ability, the goal is really quality of life, right? So there is what we call patient-centered outcomes. You want to make sure that the patient is happy with their outcome and with their quality of life. So it's different than when you're treating someone with a drug and you're trying to show that it dissolves a blood clot. Mm. You're given a drug and saying it prevents stroke recurrence. This is an intervention more to say oh, I think I feel better. I think I can walk better. Uh, I'm just happier in my day. Mm -hmm. So when I look at it like this, my threshold becomes a little bit lower, to be honest with you. So if, if there is an intervention that's safe, that's not costly, and it's cost effective, and if it's making the patient feels better, even if it's a placebo effect, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. I'm I, I think that's sufficient for me because, again, our ultimate goal is improved quality of life and just the patient feeling better. That's part of quality of life. Mm -hmm. and, and how often is that sort of um, in the world of neurology as you're treating patients, you know, how often is the that patient reported outcome or even those conversations about what's working, what's not working involved in your decisions? Uh, so, I mean, it's it's always involved in my decisions when it's something that we don't have an evidence from a randomized control, control trials for. So there are a lot of our things the patient will come and ask, can I do this? Can I do that? So again, in my decision, I see how much this would cost. And if it's something that's significantly expensive and I think there's no evidence, I tell them there is no evidence, hmm. it's expensive. It, may not hurt you. It looks like it's safe. If you want to try it, you can, but with the understanding that you might be throwing your money away and it's not going to help you. But I always have this conversation with them. And if it's something that's, I think it's safe again, as I said, and it's cheap and someone wants to try it, I tell them, I really don't know the clear answer. You can try it for a short period of time and let's revisit this issue and see if it's something you want to continue or not. Mm -hmm. And I think that I, I always appreciate that approach. And that was one of the things that I, I think the, the very first meeting that you and I ever had um, in your office that I think really stuck out to me was you had said something, you know, as you risk, as you uh, uh, balance the, the uh, risk profile, if it's safe and there's limited side effects, if the patient says that it's improving their life and whatever that means, whether that's functionally or even not functionally, but they feel like it's improving their life, that you're willing to give it a try because the patient thinks it's best for them. And obviously there's a risk and a cost ratio there to, to balance. But I think that that's a, uh, you know, from my experience, a, a novel approach in medicine to be think about uh, care that way. I, I mean, we always criticize the placebo effect and we, we look at it in a negative way. But the truth is, I don't think it's always bad. <laughs> <laughs> that's a fair point. That is a fair point. Um, and as we think about long-term stroke care, um, you know, we've done a lot of work in looking at uh, walking deficits long-term for folks who have, had, who have chronic stroke, which is typically three to six months post-stroke when they have persistent deficits. You know, it's, it's really at the point at which, and we see this along the continuum of care where people stop typically getting physical therapy or stop getting as many services as they were getting early on in their stroke care, but their deficits persist. Uh, you know, and that's a still a, a large number of folks who have ongoing 
deficits. But there's really sort of a lack of resources or a lack of um, uh, uh, clinicians even to treat these patients as they go long term. Do you see a benefit in not just telemedicine, but technology to be able to, I mean, is there an unmet need there? Is there a, a need for innovation in this space? Uh, th there is no question. I mean, I, I think actually the future is uh, how we restore function, mm. uh, whether it's complete restoration or partial restoration. And I think devices and technology and innovation will have to play a huge part in this. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so I think, for example, not maybe telemedicine. I'm sure you are well of tele rehab mm -hmm. uh, technology for different assistive devices than what we have now. Mm -hmm. uh, something like uh, what you actually just uh, alluded to, like using music uh, mm -hmm. or, or auditory stimulation, rhythmic auditory stimulation, that would be helpful too. Uh, and, and maybe even there is a chance for a combination of different things. And it's not just one thing. Yeah. Uh, cell therapy, I think it's also one of the things in the future that probably there will be a role for it. Uh, I think right now, a lot of it is experimental, but uh, I, I think we're learning a lot from it. And I think the future will be, yeah. we'll see it differently. No, it's very interesting to think about that long-term care. And I know historically in medicine, and we hear this from our, uh, you know, the patients that we treat often, um, that historically it was believed that once somebody hit that chronic phase of stroke, that they may have been told, maybe even by physicians or doctors or healthcare workers, that once you reach that chronic phase of stroke, that that's where you're going to plateau forever, that there's no point, there's no um, possibility of improvement after that point. What's your perspective on that? So it's, it's hard to know because I think one of the reasons why we say this because we don't have anything to change the trajectory of this yet, right? Mm -hmm. So we close the door immediately. But, but I think without really exploring it and trying to see if there are innovations to change the course, then I think our thinking will change. So my thing is that I'm open-minded about it. Uh, I, I, I think so far, yes, we don't have this magical bullet yet but it doesn't mean that it's not going to come. And it doesn't mean that if we stop, we're going to find anything. So we, we just have to try basically until right. something works out. Yeah. Right. And I guess that's a good lead in here just as a sort of final uh, question here is what does the future of research look like uh, for stroke survivors? Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I guess maybe I sort of answered this question. I think the focus would be really how to restore function. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, as I said, the future will be a lot of technology, a lot of devices and uh, cell therapy. I, I think that's really where the future is. Uh, you actually just reminded me, I mean, one of the things I'm interested in my research in, in, in people with bleeding is uh, non-invasive brain stimulation to see whether this would help with recovery or not. Uh, but again, the future also probably would be combination of things because right now we're trying this and this and this and individual things, but maybe you get a little incremental benefit from each one of them. And, and if you combine things, maybe actually you get a greater benefit. Uh, so there will be a lot of trials and errors, but I, I think it will happen. Hopefully more trials than error, right? <laughs> Well, well, good. Well, Magdi, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's, it's an honor to, 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 to talk with you. It's an honor to have you on the board and really appreciate your perspective here um, in such a relevant topic, given the times and, and what's going on. So thank you for your perspective very much. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Um, and we look forward to seeing you next month. Um, and the next speaker will be announced very soon, but appreciate you tuning in and we'll talk to you next time. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Take care.